Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. Last week, we brought you our conversation with Dr. Harvey Blackburn from the USDA's Agricultural Research Service Division, the ARS for short. If you remember, the good doctor heads up the National Animal Germplasm Program in Fort Collins, Colorado. That's the NAGP if you prefer the shorter version for that one, too. This facility is the big research and lending library and cryopreservation vault that, in the words of the ARS website, works to promote genetic security and increase genetic understanding of U.S. livestock, our improvement and backup plan for agriculture, as we learned last week. Now, Dr. Blackburn is the program coordinator of that program, but someone has to do the -the on-the-ground research, including the collection, analysis, and testing. So this week, we're bringing you our conversation with Dr. Phil Purdy, who also works for the ARS and NAGP, but does the nitty-gritty part of the research. His title is Animal Physiologist. But from what we can gather, he's an expert that spends a good chunk of his time running around the country doing collection, analysis, distribution, and long-term studies on germplasm success methodologies in all different kinds of animals. I used to think of germplasm as an egg and sperm kind of thing. But as we've learned, that's a bit too limited in scope these days. Examples can include semen and eggs, But many types of tissue can be important to analyze and store, too, including embryos, organs, gonads, and other DNA samples. And the collection isn't just one species. According to his ARS bio, Dr. Purdy applies his expertise to a good number of species, including aquaculture, beef and dairy cattle, goats, insects, pigs, poultry, and sheep, to name just a few. To give you a mental picture of him, Dr. Purdy is a Stillwaters Run Deep kind of guy. I can't think of a better personality and skill set to do what he does, to be honest. For the three days we were there filming, he was all that was methodical and studious, hardworking, unruffled, with a little bit of curiosity and philosophy in there too. But it was pretty much covered in science guy, down-to-business demeanor, and sharp as a tack in a quiet way. But you need all those kinds of characteristics when you're doing what this guy does and when the results are so important. The samples and the data that he collects might be, after all, the basis for much of the genetic material that we have for future livestock generations and the path we take to get there. On top of all those skill sets, I just have to say that Dr. Purdy is a personality I can really relate to. He has a background in accounting and HR, believe it or not but ended up succumbing to the pull of livestock, research, and learning, and the sciences. He's just my kind of guy. So we met up with Dr. Purdy on site at Desert Weir. As you might remember, Desert Weir is O.G. McGuire's sheep farm in Paonia, in the high desert region on the western side of the state of Colorado. You may remember our podcast with O.G. McGuire ways back. And you can hear her again in this podcast as she jumps in once or twice to contribute to the conversation. She's a really important contributor in not only bringing breed security to the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep breed here in the United States, but she's also a data goddess of the Ovis Aries universe. That would be sheep to you and I, by the way. Uji's a programmer, and she built software called the Land Tracker Program, which tracks all kinds of data on the micro scale using microchips in the sheep, a thing that looks like a supermarket scanner, and a big fat spreadsheet program. She's been saving all that minutia on her flock for years. In other words, data mining and analytics before it became a hugely popular tool with the rest of the universe. So that means that Dr. Purdy and Uji are a perfect pair to do studies for the USDA on how artificial insemination is most effective in sheep 
with in-depth, long-term information that can be analyzed for all kinds of variables that might be vital to success. And as with all things, the details are important. You can't just collect semen at any old time from any old male and pop it in the cryovat and unfreeze it when you need it, pop it in a female, and expect to have a good success rate. That's true of artificial insemination no matter which animal you're working on. But in the case of the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep at Desert Weir, there's solid data to use and a solid scientist doing the methodology and analysis. That means that, thanks to two dedicated individuals, we've got a strong chance of really learning something applicable across species. Dr. Purdy, with Uji's help, is trying to figure out more than just the best way to collect a sample. He's calculating the most effective way in the long term for the success of the whole process of artificial insemination and what variables might have an impact. So just off the top of your head, think about how many factors you might have to consider if the success of a breed or an industry might depend on you and your work. And by success, we mean the highest possible chance of collecting a healthy semen sample that's preserved in a way that has a high chance of successfully being unfrozen later. To successfully meet a healthy egg, which turns into a healthy lamb, which successfully makes it into adulthood and beyond. The process alone is fraught with potential pitfalls. And that's just the freezing, thawing, and implanting part. It goes without saying that if your method is faulty or sloppy, your success rate also tanks in a hurry. But what are the non-process factors that might make a difference? The breed, age, and sex, or type of animal. The time of year. The nutrition of the livestock, including when they're fed and what they're fed. The common availability of water throughout the year. The climate. Do we get a freeze or a thaw? Lots of rain? The geology. Availability of salt and micronutrients. The proximity of males and females to each other throughout the year timing of estrus, and so on, and so on. And if that weren't enough, you now have to think about the chemicals in your region. That might seem like a far-fetched consideration, but Peonia had coal mining in the past, and it now has the possibility of fracking in the surrounding valleys. So I'm quite sure that's now a new variable for Uji's flock. Even if you don't have fracking nearby, no farmer is immune to the chemicals that float down rivers or come out of the sky no matter where you live, if you listen to what Bob Quinn has to say about it, even in the far reaches of somewhere as remote as Big Sandy, Montana, or Paonia, Colorado. Chemicals are everywhere now, and they affect our ability to procreate. That means livestock, too. So we hope you enjoy our podcast with an amazing scientist, Dr. Phil Purdy. He and the intrepid Uji McGuire allowed us to film three eye-opening, up-close and personal days of collection and research process on the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep. And yes, we saw pretty much everything. So if you're a delicate soul or you think your kids aren't ready for the birds and the bees or the tubes and the freeze, then viewer and listener discretion is advised. Nothing too graphic, but be forewarned just in case. Come to think of it, Rick might have some great gag reel footage. He did have to do a few contortions to get a shot here and there. And there. And there. I'm going to have to ask him about that later. From the very windy and beautiful high desert agricultural region of Paonia, Colorado, for one of our most enjoyable stops in our grand adventure, here is Dr. Phil Purdy. If you could explain, uh, you, say your name and your position and what you're doing here. I'm Dr. Phil Purdy. I'm with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Services, National Animal Germplasm Program. Uh, we are working with Ken and Uji McGuire here at Desert Weir Farms to um, back up the genetics for the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep in North America. And also we are doing collaborative research on artificial insemination in sheep. Okay, what does back up the genetics mean to you? So for all of the agricultural breeds in the U.S., that's across species, uh, we want to capture the genetic diversity of each one of those breeds. 
uh, and when we say that we're talking about complete genetic diversity so we're looking across that particular breed to make sure that we can recreate uh, that breed in the event that there is a need for either recreation or expansion of genetics within that particular breed uh, or for purposes of uh, research and things like that so that we have that germplasm, semen eggs, embryos, DNA, etc. So um, how does the USDA um do any kind of do they do any kind of a conformity to the standard like the American Poultry Association standard for a Y and dot might be X? Do you confirm all that, or you just take the germplasm as you need to? Are you talking about confirmation to standard? So if the Welsh Black or, Mountain Sheep breeder says here I've got I've got samples, do you just take it? Well, it it really depends. It's a breed by breed, species by species issue, because right here the Maguires. Uji McGuire is actually the breed secretary. So we have the registration papers for every one of the animals that we work with. Under some situations, for breeds that actually have fewer numbers, we have to rely on the people that actually own the animal and know and are a part of that particular breed association, if there is even a breed association, um, to, to trust them in that and know which genetics we're actually capturing. When you go to something like more of a major breed, think Holstein or something like that, the papers are definitely there, there's established organizations, there's established identification numbers, um, and so we have all of that data behind it to ensure that we are capturing exactly what we are after. So, it, yeah, it's not easy. How, how is it different collecting uh, sperm from a sheep versus from a fish from a chicken? Difficulty physically collecting them? Yeah, yeah so it really is apples and oranges. Uh, when you start looking at the mammalian species, most of these rams can actually be trained. Uh, same thing with bulls, same thing with boars, something like that. You can actually train them either to a phantom mount or to mount uh, a ewe that is in heat or a salad or something like that. And, and then you can uh, very easily and simply, depending on the species, um, actually collect the sample using an artificial vagina of some sort. Um, slight differences as to how the bull responds versus a ram, those are very similar, but boar actually requires a, a physical pressure uh, on his genitalia to actually get the sample. Um, when you look at something like uh, fish, many of them actually, um, you put them into a tub with a mild sedative. Um, when they get to a point where they're very docile, you just dry them off and you can do what's, uh, what's known in the industry as stripping, where you just run your hand down their abdomen and they you very easily provide the sample to you. Something like the poultry, um, for those it, it's actually quite simple too. Again, it's a training function where you can actually train the rooster to respond to you. You lay them on their chest, you hold their feet, make sure that they're in a comfortable position uh, because then they, they really have no problem with what you're doing. You stroke their back end, their tail feathers, and a little bit of a squeeze and you've, you've got a nice clean sample in a small cup make a difference in terms of what you want to collect and how difficult it is to collect it? So uh, the question really was what are we collecting from the different species? Yes. Isn't that? So from all of the species we, we like to have a DNA sample which can be in one form or another because you can do genetic distancing, you can do uh, searching for genetics, you can do you know endless number of things with that. That can be blood, that can be a tissue sample. You know you can collect the white blood cells which are just DNA rich. Um, poultry are even luckier because their red cells are DNA rich so the entire blood sample if you can get that is, is viable. Um, then from the males we are after semen samples so that we can freeze that semen use that for artificial insemination. From the females we are after um, uh, eggs, oocytes, but depending on the species that you're working with that can be either very simple or a challenge. Um, for example when there are cattle um, it's very easy to go to a slaughterhouse if you know somebody who is slaughtering their cattle and say, I want the ovaries from that particular cow. And a lot of slaughterhouses can actually identify those for you, hand them to you. You can uh, aspirate the eggs from the ovary, freeze them a day later, uh, and you can have reasonable success with those. Uh, under some situations, we even have embryos. We prefer eggs because that way we can match the male and the female and get the desired offspring that we want. But at the same time, we're not going to say no to embryos if they have been from research projects or from particular lines of uh, cattle, as an example, where they have been purposely created because they know that desired offspring of that embryo. Um, so 
the challenges really come to uh, things like with poultry, you can't freeze an egg. Um, you can do a number of things with that that we're learning in terms of uh, some people are starting to report embryo transfer with chickens. Um, once you freshly laid egg, you can actually transfer that embryo. You can do in vitro fertilization, a number of these things. It still remains to be fully seen, but as a result, we've gone into um, freezing the gonads from day old chicks. And from those, you can do a surgical technique and actually recreate the line using that frozen thawed material. So it, it's very species dependent uh, as well as sex dependent as to what you can actually utilize. We like to utilize everything that we possibly can. So. Okay, so, um, so I know that the USDA is doing a, a, a lot of work in this area. It's mostly for, uh, almost all for agriculture, correct? It's the production of animals that are used for the purposes of food. But how do you think that the technologies that you're developing would help us in general with the species that we're losing on the planet? Well, I, that's kind of the beauty of it, because when you really get into the world of reproductive physiology, there's a constant sharing of information. So if you want to look at the human model for assisted reproductive techniques, a lot of that has come from, you know, the exact same types of things that I work with. Um, you know, the, the embryo freezing, the embryo transfer, all of these different types of things. You know, they've been doing that in cattle for a number of years. I think fewer in human than in cattle. Um, I'd have to check that to be sure, but there's the constant back and forth within the scientific literature. I do it all the time myself. I read about how folks will work with uh, those techniques, whether it's semen freezing, egg freezing, embryo freezing, uh, culture of these different types of cells, things like that. And I apply that to a number of different species where I think it might fit in best. So really, the science is just a platform. Then pick a species and learn the specifics that are going to be necessary to apply that particular technique, because everything's just a little different. So if we, with the layperson, with the example for the layperson, maybe, maybe be that we might not have lost the passenger pigeon and the dodo if we had this type of technique. Most certainly. And, you know, we view that as, uh, from, that is from the USDA, our perspective really, is that if you have the material frozen, is an endangered or an extinct species really endangered or extinct? If it's alive in the tanks, we can always do something with it. It just might not be literally on the ground. So I think there's always that opportunity for it. Excellent. I now have one other question. If that sure. clear. So how many, how many different animals do you need to maintain a genetically viable pool if you're just saving the sperm? That's actually a very challenging question. It's very simple the way you put it, and you put it very well, but it's, it's very difficult uh, to answer exactly what you need. And what we take into account are the, by species, the post thaw quality of the material that we're freezing. And again, this is on either side. I mean, let, let's, we, can, we can apply an equation of sorts for either uh, recreation of a breed using semen, recreation of a breed using eggs, or recreation of a breed using embryos. And again, it, it really doesn't, doesn't matter which one we're talking about. What, com what really matters is that we have a good understanding of, for that particular species, what the post-thaw quality is of that material. Because for some species, if we look at um, the post-thaw quality of rooster sperm, for example, there's a number of intricacies about it. And as a result, you get 10 to 15% fertility overall when you're doing that. That's why we explore other techniques. But if we go to the, the you know, cattle industry, or something like that, um, your fertility is gonna be much, much higher using frozen thawed bull sperm as an example. You should really be achieving 50% or higher if you're really paying attention to your estrosynchronization, all of these other different types of things um, to get the highest quality offspring possible, the highest quality within your synchronization regimen and fertility uh, things. So you really have to kind of view it from that regard. And then what you have to do is also lay on top of that is the number of animals for that particular breed that are out there. So if we've got a, ver a very small breed, I mean something in terms of total numbers very small, we want every one of those you know, rams that are out there and we want to get as much semen from them as we can over a particular time and then resample again in a couple years after they turn generations. But when you start to look at something like uh, Holstein cattle, very, very large numbers of animals, 
very well established fertility, we know we should be able to achieve and things like that. From any one particular bowl, we don't need as much because we've already got so much material that's already in the repository. So, so it's sort of a balance and you have to kind of play that out depending on what you have and what you can achieve. So, so then I guess the other factor really is that once you have then um, established the amount of material that you need for any particular breed or species or things like that, what you end up doing is you, uh, we run what's called a cluster analysis. So um, for every breed that we work with, we get access to the pedigrees for that particular breed and basically create a family tree. Find out how many families are available within that breed and make sure that we can capture the genetic diversity that's within those. And then so when we're working with, uh, with the folks here at Desert Weir, the McGuire's, we are only going to work with particular clusters, these families, um, of rams for purposes of the artificial insemination trial that we're performing. And the reason is it's a management tool as well. We don't want to just come in and say, no, I only want to work with these rams, but what we want to do is we want to be part of the breeding scheme that the McGuire's have for their sheep. So particular clusters might not get used for the fertility trial, but we definitely want those for uh, the repository to make sure that we have fully captured the genetic diversity of that particular breed. One of the important things about the cluster analysis that was done by NAGP for the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep Association is that it allowed us to identify a couple clusters that existed only in individual flocks. Two of the rams we'll be attempting to collect this afternoon and that they're high on the priority to get this week are rams from clusters that do not exist in the repository right now. We don't have any use to breed to them, but they also only existed in a single flock. One of the rams came from New Hampshire and another ram came from Washington State, Oregon area. You know, they, there are actually two flocks out there, one in Washington and one in Oregon. And so those boys are here primarily for semen collection and they're going to be hopefully rams that will produce for us this afternoon and if not they're going to get multiple opportunities. And that's something that the Black Welsh Mountain Sheep Breeders worked together to be sure that we know where all our clusters are, we know where who has all the animals that exist in those clusters and then we try to work among us to spread those animals around and it's a backup procedure. You know, if something happens to that flock in New Hampshire, well, one of the things did happen. The gentleman's retiring. He sold the flock. Most of it went off to one place, but we've been trying to place those sheep clusters, breeding groups, into other flocks so that it's spread geographically and not as much at risk. Now, you have a very strong breed organization, obviously, because you're, you're running the show here. If, if, if I bludgeon people into having a strong breed organization. <laughs> so if there are breeds out there, sheep included, but others as well, if there are breeds that don't have strong breed organizations, have you used the tools that, for instance, the Livestock Conservancy uh, has for DNA collection, for breeder directory and meeting? Have you ever used those? We run our own breeder um, registry system and our own breed directory so I haven't used any of those tools from the Livestock Conservancy. Um, we're actually probably going to be working on some stuff that's going to be open source and available for use because the software package that we're running the registry on right now is has been its base database has been orphaned the development stopped about five years ago and it's not clear that the company that makes it is going to be able to transition to a modern database that's going to run on modern computers fast enough. So one of the things that I've been working on is my lamb tracker program has been designed, that I'm using for flock management, personal flock management, has been designed so that it can be easily expanded to be a registry package. I just got to find time to code it. I, I look at the locations that we've been to so far, and some of them are fairly remote. And I would think that that's maybe one of the things that's kept breeds um, the integrity of the line, but that's also something that makes it difficult to find other breeders that you might breed with. So as they add into the computer and places like your, your organization and Livestock Conservancy, places like that that have a central database where you can connect with other breeders, does that change the face of how small breeders uh, run their flocks or herds? I think it's critical. The, the whole trans-U.S. 
transport of rams and breeding stock from New Hampshire, New York, Maryland, um, Indiana, Colorado, out to the West Coast only happened because we could talk and we could send more than just a phone message. The same thing happened up in Canada. We had rams, there are two clusters that only exist in Canada. We had rams and ewes of those clusters in Canada, but they weren't in the same flocks. So it took this cross coordination to get, okay, somebody's gonna step up, take care of that cluster. So everybody basically sent the rams and the ewes of that cluster to that flock. They're taking care of it, they're breeding it, they're gonna expand it. And when there's enough animals, they're going to send those animals back out to the original people. But if we hadn't done that, that cluster would have died out because the rams were one place and the ewes were another. And, and that sort of communication is a whole lot easier when you've got good internet. It's one of the reasons that we've also been strongly pushing and why our local electric cooperative is in the process of putting in fiber. And we're going to get fiber to the farm soon, I hope, <laughs> because we need it. We need that bandwidth. We need that access. Would you both, or one or both of you, just kind of quickly explain the process of what you're going to do here, please? <laughs> and that's on you. We're using techniques that are standard through the industry. We're going to use an artificial vagina. And what this does is it's a, uh, a PVC tube that has a latex liner. And you fill that liner with warm water. You lubricate it so that uh, it's going to replicate the uh, stimulus that a used vagina will create. And so we will have a U that has been synchronized um, so that she's going to be in heat right about now. And that's going to be enough stimulus to get these rams interested. And when they jump, I just basically slide in with the artificial vagina and guide his penis into that. He will ejaculate in there. If, uh, if it's one of these mature rams, um, this should take all of about uh, 10 seconds from the time I enter the pen. Um, if he needs a little training, uh, it could take a couple of minutes to get it done, but uh, but it's normally very, 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 very rapid. And then you said you run to the fridge? We go over there and we, uh, uh, we'll do a, a crude quality control, uh, make sure that it's, uh, the sperm concentration is sufficient, the motility is sufficient, and then we'll dilute it into a cryopreservation media, uh, cool it for a couple hours, load it into semen straws, and freeze it this afternoon as well, and then check a post saw quality on it to make sure that it's at least up to a, a minimum standard of quality for uh, purposes of artificial insemination the way that we're performing it. It's a non-surgical method that we use. And then you said you ship these, some of these off UPS? The, the other samples that we'll be collecting for, our, for the repository, we'll do the exact same thing up to the point of dilution. We'll cool those, we put them in a box with some ice packs, uh, and we can ship those overnight back to the laboratory in Fort Collins, and my technician, uh, Scott, will freeze those uh, the following day. Yeah. Fantastic. So how do you know if it takes? What? On, on your use. How do you know if the process takes once the artificial insemination occurs, if you're going to inseminate? When lambs come out. That's it. We can't do ultrasound here because it's, we, well, we've got an ultrasound machine. We just haven't gotten very skilled in for sure identifying whether it's an AI pregnancy or a later pregnancy because the ewes will get AI and then they'll get backed up with a live cover ram a, a certain amount of time later so that we hopefully have, everybody will have a lamb, but it's just who's, who's the daddy depends on when the lamb comes out and that's when we know how things work. So as a... As a farmer, this could be a risky thing to, to do a new process like this. You could oh yeah, a... there was one year it was a total disaster and we didn't get any pregnancies from the AI and not only that, it screwed up for the live cover. So we were out the year's worth of production. So yeah, it's a risk. I think it's an important risk. I think it's a risk that we need to do, but it certainly can be a risk. Jump again. I'm going to let him. He didn't get. Uh... Let me go in and 
Do you want me to come in and move him? Oh, nope, there he goes. There he goes. Yeah, this isn't a large sample. Um, the ram wasn't fully roused for some reason. Not sure why, because she's fully in heat. Um, but um, sometimes they do have, uh, you know, a little more libido than that. What was your most interesting uh, experience in collection? Whether that be exciting, whether that be humorous, all the above. Do you have any little funny story you might want to tell? Again on camera. <laughs> I don't know. Uji's pointing at me. I'm thinking. I'm. I'm not sure. There's so many. <laughs> They, they vary by species. Um, what's that? Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably don't want that on there. What Uji's talking about is, yeah, when you're collecting, things spray, regardless of species, quite often. So you always, when you're the collecting... The last filmmaker ended up with some really good close-ups on the lens, unintended. So you're telling me to be careful today? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Depends on how close you are. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you always have those mishaps. Um, uh, I actually went on a collection trip with Don Bixby, who used to work for American Livestock Breeds Conservancy years ago. He went with us up to make some sheep contacts in the uh, in the Northwest. We were at a Romney breeder and. Um, one thing led to another. We were trying to collect and the ram went under my back end and he was so tall that I was sitting on him facing his back end. He was going that way and my feet weren't touching the ground and there's Don Bixby laughing at me along with the producer and I just kind of <laughs> dumped off like it was a bad bull or something. And so, I mean, it, you wear the samples, you ride the animals whether you want to or not. I mean, it's just, you come out and get ready to get dirty. So. So you, you said that you used to do accounting prior to this, and uh, is this is a little different. Well, I've, I've got a degree in accounting. I was even a stockbroker for a short amount of time. I was in retail management, human resources, and, and um, I just realized I needed to get out of an office environment, uh, or, or more of a traditional office environment. And uh, so I went back to school. I, I planned on uh, majoring in beef cattle production. I, I thought it would be a great opportunity to, you know, work on a big ranch, something like that. And um, the first day, the class was reproductive physiology, and I had a great professor, Dr. Erickson, down at Sol Ross State. And next thing I knew, I was I was just smitten. Um, the science just kind of overwhelmed me and, and sucked me in, and the opportunities that were there for learning were just tremendous. And uh, yeah, so the next thing I knew, I was uh, working across species with with all of these different techniques, and went to Colorado State then. And, Got my doctor there. Just a quick note. I kept trying to be respectful of his educational background and call him Dr. Purdy, but after the second time he said, call me Phil, I succumbed for the most part. He's a regular guy and the kind of guy you want to go to the local pub with and have a beer and a lamb sausage with after hours. And we did just that. And I won't tell you whether or not we got any additional stories out of him about his adventures no matter what you just heard there at the end. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films Our YouTube URL is YouTube.com Backyard Green Films We would like to thank Dr. Purdy for speaking with us today. And a special thanks goes out to Uji McGuire at Desert Ware Farm for putting us up for three days and also putting up with us for three days of filming. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. 
For more information, please visit usda.gov and desertware.com. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.